Okay, so uh, I'm going to tell you who I am again. So hi everyone, I'm still Paul, it's lovely to be here. Um, just a, a quick show of hands for me. Um, who's seen me talk before? Some of you? Okay, cool. Um, who here has used, I just want to look at languages, um, who here has used C or C++? Is this a C and C++ users group? Oh, damn! Okay, that would make sense. This contains no C++ whatsoever. Um, who has done Python? Perl, Ruby, Java, Forth. Sweet, okay, that's awesome. Haskell, nice, okay, cool. So this is a story about none of those things. Um, this, this is a story about love. And um, do we have a clicker? That's cool. Okay, this is a story about love. Um, this is a story about freedom. Um, I don't know if anyone here has heard of this thing called open source. Um, I'm rather big on open source. I think it's fantastic. Um, I really, really love open source. I really love freedom. I really love writing code. I write heaps and heaps of code. And um, I really love uh, dancing. I love this thing called dance dance immolation. And uh, you might be wondering, what, what on earth is dance dance immolation? Well, it's kind of like dance dance revolution, which you can play down at ground control, um, except with dance dance immolation, you're on fire. And, um, and I, and this was absolutely awesome. I got to do this at Burning Man last year. And, um, and one of the fun things is that if you're doing something where you're you know, playing Dance Dance Simulation or playing any of these things, you can actually track stuff. So if you're playing Dance Dance Revolution or Step Mania, which is the open source version of that, you can read all this data out and the songs you've played and like how amazingly well you've gone at your latest like Justin Bieber albums and all that sort of stuff. Um, I can track all those sorts of things. So for a long time, um, I've been tracking stuff like my dance lessons. Um, I actually have this as Beeminder. It draws me little graphs and everything. It threatens me if I don't go to my dance lessons on time. Um, I do things like tracking my inbox. Um, that there starts at 12,000, 1,200 messages. It's gone down, which is fantastic. But I also do things like I track my mood. Um, and I track what I've done each day. So I love to sort of record data. Um, one of my goals is to give me a snapshot of here is what I've done each day. So I can go, oh, what was I doing three months ago? Or what was I doing on this day here? And sort of get a, a, a high level overview. You know, I went here, I wrote this code, I played this song on Dance Dance Revolution, whatever it happens to be. And um, I actually found a really cool tool for this. And that tool was called I Done This. And um, I Done This, my housemate recommended them. And um, uh, they're a little startup company and they gave you this brilliant thing. What they did is they said, okay, you can record what you did each day and you can do that on a website and they've got a phone app and you can do this via email. And then what made this genuinely valuable to me is one year later, they would send me an email of here's what you were doing one year ago. And if they didn't have data for a year, they'd be like, here's what you're doing six months ago or three months ago or one month ago or whatever that happens to be. And so I would get these things where it's like, hey, one year ago, you were at OzCon crying into your laptop writing your slides. And I'm like, oh my goodness, that's what I'm doing now. And so this sort of stuff would happen every single year. So um, ironically, when I actually wrote uh, this version of the slides, um, it was me giving a talk at Plug, which was not the Portland Linux users group, but the Perth Linux users group. And, um, and sure enough, I was doing that a year ago, like on the 1st of May. So I thought this was fantastic. Um, and every day I'd wake up and I'd get this summary of what I was doing a year ago. And that was awesome until the point where they turned it off. And, and I was absolutely outraged. It's like, this is my favorite feature. This is the whole reason I'm using your service. And you've turned that off. They were still allowing you to say what you've done, but they weren't telling you, here's what you're doing a year ago. So I did what you know, any sort of concerned citizen on the internet would do uh, to express my discomfort by this. I, I wrote them a very stern email telling them that I was unimpressed and, and they apologized, um, but they said no, they weren't gonna turn it back on. And the reason was they were this small startup and email was like taking up a lot of time and a lot of resources and that's not how they were making money and that was not how they they'd, they'd thought they'd make money. So they're like, we're really sorry, we can't turn this back on. So I'm like, okay, all, all my data's there. Um, I still want to have access to it. Um, so I took action. And um, they didn't have an API, so I, I wrote them an API. And it's surprising how easy it is to go to a lot of websites and just sort of, um, I don't know if anyone used Firebug before, open up something like Firebug and go, okay, what's going over the wire? Oh, hey, here's a great big blob of JSON and everything. Oh, that's all the data I want. I can grab that. So I wrote them an API. 
Um, and then, of course, because I don't like using the web, um, I wrote them a command line client. So I could do everything I needed from the command line. Here's what I've done, look up what I was doing on this day, search for things, so on and so forth. Um, also, because I know they like to turn off features, I wrote a data export tool. So if you want to migrate away from them, then you can, you can get all your data back. And uh, then, of course, I re-implemented all of the dropped features. So I could once again have an email every morning of here's what I was doing a, a year ago. And um, I released the code, I'm a Perl person, um, so I released the code up on the CPAN as web service I done this. And um, after doing all that, make sure it's all tested and like telling everyone, I went to the company, I went to ID and I'd done this, and I'm like, hey guys, um, surprise! I wrote you all this stuff, I hope you're cool with that. And um, some companies, if you say, I've written like an API and a data export tool and a bunch of other things, and these people over here are using it, they sometimes might not be impressed with that. Um, but the people that I'd done this were actually super cool. And they're like, oh my goodness, this is fantastic. Um, we're going to make sure that your tools keep working. So tell us which endpoints you're using and we'll make sure we don't change those because we don't want to break your tools. And in fact, an hour before I arrived here, I got another email from them which is like, hey, can we consult with you on API design? Because we want to actually implement an API and we know that you're already doing that sort of thing. So it had a really happy ending, um, but not always. Not everyone has a happy ending. And uh, one thing that you might discover from using the internet is that services die. So I, many years ago, um, I had a GeoCities homepage. Um, I don't know if anyone here remembers GeoCities at all. My homepage was totally cool. It was still under construction, but it was totally cool. Um, that's animated, but unfortunately OpenOffice doesn't animate it properly. Um, so, you know, sometimes things get shut down. Sometimes things get re-featured. Um, the number of times I've had a phone app and it's like, there is a new update. And I look at the new reviews on that update and everyone's like, this sucks. And it's like, okay, I'm not updating then. Things get re-featured. Um, the licenses change, it really worries me how many times, you know, we're just like, oh, here's a, an end user license agreement. Um, but we can change that whenever we want. And if you continue to use the service, you have to deal with it. There's actually a, um, a website um, IndieWebCamp.com slash site deaths, which sort of records all of the various sites out there and how they have died. Um, either they've completely died or they've been mothballed. Um, those of you who have heard of this thing called Google, um, Google keeps on having services and then shutting them down. And there is the Google graveyard, and the Google graveyard, you can see all the various Google services uh, which have been shut down. Um, Orkut is on there now. Orkut shut down very recently or is in the process of shutting down. Um, this is also interactive. You can click on them and it leaves a flower on the gravestone. And it only like gives you the last 10,000 flowers or something, but you can see what services people are missing. So I don't want to sort of say don't use services on the internet um, because really services on the internet are absolutely amazing. It's a magical place. Um, what I want to do is say, how can you embrace your data? How can you make sure that if you are using a service on the internet, if that service goes down, you still have all of your data, you still have the ability to work with that, you can possibly re-implement those features. Now, normally, that would be a really hard task. Because normally you'd go, well, I can't really implement the things which this thing does, but goodness me, you're all freaking developers. And like, developers are the closest thing we have to magic. Like whenever I'm, I'm with somebody who's non-technical and I write some code, they're just like, oh my goodness, my mind is blown. That was like three months of my work and you did it in like 10 minutes. And you know, it's, it's amazing. So you can shape your experiences as being a developer. So I'm gonna start with one uh, tool, which some of you might've heard of. If this and that, who's used this? Some of you, okay. If this and that, um, they've got a cool little logo. Um, they're a great little connector. The idea is that they plug into every single service you can imagine, and you can say, when this occurs over here, I want to trigger this action. So um, when you see me post on Facebook more than five times in an hour, send me an SMS to tell me to stop doing that. Um, or when my favorite webcomic comes out, you know, send that to me in an email. Or when I update my picture on this form of social media, update it in other forms as well. And, and I think this is great. I absolutely love if this and that. But there's a big problem. There's a couple of problems for me. One is that it runs in the cloud. So they have all of my data. I don't have any backups. If they fall over, I've lost all of my, you know, if this and that recipes and everything. 
And the other part, of course, is it requires all of your data. It requires all of the ways of authenticating to those services you want to use. So if I want to use this with Facebook, I need to connect it to Facebook. And if I want to use it with Twitter, I need to connect it there. And they end up having my email and they end up knowing what my favorite web comics are and all of these other sorts of things. And they end up knowing everything about me with all of my data. And I don't really want that. I think that should be something that's just between me and the NSA. So I wrote my own tools. And that's what this is about, um, this little framework called ExoBrain that I've sort of been tinkering around. And this started off as just a, a couple of, uh, of scripts to sort of get me to turn up to dance lessons, and it's grown larger and larger from there. So um, one of the things which ExoBrain does is it focuses very much on this concept of, uh, of abstraction. So you can say, OK, I've got a, uh, an event on social media, and I'll show you this in a moment. It doesn't matter what type of social media it is, you can have generic recipes which work with that. The other thing which uh, ExoBrain uses is this pluggable framework. So the idea is that you can write agents for ExoBrain, and you can plug them in and you can disconnect them while everything else is still running, which means that uh, if you want to update something, you just need to update that code. You don't need to restart the whole thing. Under the hood, it's using 0MQ as a message framework. If you're familiar with that, um, it's not strongly bound to that. There's like a very small amount which is actually using those services. So if you wanted to re-implement this with RabbitMQ or ActiveMQ or something like that, it would probably be pretty easy to do so. So the idea is you can connect and disconnect at will. Um, it's pretty easy to restart it. It's pretty easy to patch. I change bits of this all the time. Um, installing ExoBrain, of course, is what you want to do. Um, it's a little bit more challenging, um, mainly because it has a high dependency requirement. And this is much, much better than it used to be, um, but it still wants to like install lots and lots of things. Um, I've had friends install this on Raspberry Pis, and they said, OK, Paul, you've got these installation instructions. They tell you at this point here you should make a coffee. If you're installing on a Raspberry Pi, you should go and get a pizza and watch two episodes of Game of Thrones, and then come back, and it might be part way through. So it can take a while to install. And of course, bits are still under construction, but it's, it's getting much, much better. Um, there are instructions. I'm not going to go through them here. Um, but, you know, ExoBrain and then hash installation. Wow! So, this is supposed to be typewriter font? <laughs> this is not my computer. <laughs> so, the nutshell is, if you want to, well, this is appropriate, it's Perl. So, you know, Perl, Perl has been around for ages. So, you know, back in ye olden days, <laughs> <laughs> Back in the olden days, we would install the Perl modules like this. So you'd use your favorite CPAN uh, installer, which is CPAN minus, which I have another talk which talks about all of that. Um, and that will go and grab all the dependencies and everything, and it will install it all for you. And then you do an ExoBrain setup. And that simply says, OK, who the hell are you? Um, it does basic sort of setup of directories. It checks everything's there. To actually install uh, anything useful with ExoBrain, um, there are these subcomponents. So if you want to be doing things with Twitter, there is ye old ExoBrain Twitter that you can install. And there is ye old ExoBrain Facebook and ye old ExoBrain Zombies Run, which will probably be out tonight, and all these other sorts of things. Um, one thing I want to do is get all of this running with Docker, for anyone who's used Docker before, so I can just give you a Docker container and you can just start it up from there. But um, I'm not very good at Docker yet, so that's something I'm working on. Anyway, I want to show you some code. I want to show you what sort of stuff you can do with agents, and then what do I use this for? Um, so let's write hello world, because um, that's like the basic thing to do in any sort of uh, uh, language. So this is, this is actually Perl. Um, we start off by using ExoBrain, and ExoBrain gives you all the stuff that you'd normally switch on with Perl if you're a Perl person. So it gives you strict, it gives you warnings, it gives you method signatures, it gives you auto die, um, it gives you use feature say, so on and so forth. Um, then what I do, and it also gives me the ExoBrain class. Then I make myself uh, an instantiation of that class, so I instantiate the object. And uh, then once I've got this, I've got a method called notify, and I can just say, hey, I want to notify my user, hello world. So that's three lines that gives me a hello world. What actually happens under the hood? Well, under the hood, it makes the ExoBrain object, it raises a notification, and uh, because this is all running on 0MQ, it sends out a notification packet on that common bus. So it's like, hey, I need to notify the user of this. Um, in order to do that, it needs to connect to the router, um, which I'll talk about in just a moment, um, and sends the notification. 
What's really cool, however, is that I haven't specified how that notification should reach my user. And the idea is that uh, you would connect in, oops, you would connect in uh, notification agents and you would say, I want to deliver notifications by Twitter or SMS or pushover or email or all of these other sorts of things. And so for a long time, I had all of my ExoBrain uh, notifications delivered via Twitter. You could actually follow my ExoBrain's Twitter account and you'd see it talking to me about all these sorts of things. Um, these days I'm using Pushover, which is a, it's a phone app. It costs like $2. It's freaking awesome. Um, but you can have multiple things installed. You can send something via SMS and via pushover. You can say, if it's a high enough priority thing, I want to make sure it's, you know, I use Twilio or something to call me up and be annoying, so on and so forth. But the end result of that, if you're running that on my system, um, is you get it delivered to your phone with whatever notification you want or delivered to you with whatever notification you want. Um, I have everything going to my Pebble watch. Um, so this is the sort of thing which I see many, many times per day. Um, hey, here's a message from ExoBrain. Um, in this case, it's telling me that one of my machines is about to start a backup. Um, because, you know, I'm really, really lazy. I just plug my stuff in. I have bots that fire off that. So that's the sort of stuff which I get, um, which makes me very happy. So let's look under the hood. Um, we're using uh, Zero and Q underneath here. This is really if you want to be writing stuff for ExoBrain at a very low level. Um, and everything uh, that's pushed across that 0MQ bus um, actually uses one of these five frame packets. Now, as an end user of ExoBrain, you do not have to care about this at all. But if you're like, hey, I want to like write something in Ruby and plug that into ExoBrain, this is sort of the low level protocol it's using. Without going into too much detail, it has a bunch of stuff there. It has headers, which are used by the message bus itself. It has metadata, which is like, what time was this? Um, where did it come from, et cetera, et cetera. There is always a human readable summary. Um, you can type in exobrain debug that will connect to the bus where everything is sort of pushing data around, and you can see a human readable summary of every packet which is on that bus, which is super, super cool for debugging. It's great. And then you have data payloads, and there can be the raw data as well. And this is really the stuff that gets unpacked by agents and which they use. This is usually, hey, this is what I pulled directly off Twitter. And it's more useful for debugging, but no, you might want to use that directly. Everything which is set on the bus um, is encapsulated in JSON. Um, so the idea is that this is designed to be as language agnostic as possible. Um, and the services, are, at the moment, I'm controlling them with Ubic. And uh, Ubic is a services manager. This is sort of an older screenshot of what that looks like. Um, you can see that I've got um, various ExoBrain components which have been clumped together, and I can start them all up or I can stop them all in one go. Um, this is sort of the, the first revision of ExoBrain. It sort of broke everything up into uh, sources, classification agents, and sinks. Um, the newer ones actually lump them together by the service themselves. So there'll be everything which deals with Twitter and everything which deals with Facebook and everything which deals with SMS. Um, it tends to be much more convenient to turn those on and off. Um, if you've installed a bunch of components, you can, of course, start them with the old Ubic Start ExoBrain, which will fire everything up. Um, but you can also do things where you can say, OK, I just want to start up everything which deals with Twitter. So the big thing which I want to show you is how do you write agents? Um, because that's the most useful thing to do. You grab ExoBrain, you install a bunch of components for the endpoints you want to work with, and then you want to write some agents to, uh, to do some useful work. So one thing to know, or the basis of all this, is agents are classes. So to make an agent, you simply make a class. Um, here we're going to make a really simple agent. It's simply going to be the ping agent. So you can ping it, and it will simply respond with, hey, I'm here. Um, we're going to do that by using ExoBrain, and we're going to be using Moose. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Moose, it is an object framework for Perl. It is the most glorious thing that I have ever seen, and it's beautiful. And if at any point you're like, wow, that's really pretty, it's probably Moose's fault. One of the things which we do is if we're writing an agent, we need to say, is this going to be an agent which runs continuously, or is this going to be an agent which does some sort of polling of a source? Um, usually, if something is polling, it's you know, talking to Twitter, for example, and, um, and every minute it might go off and say, hey, do I have any new direct messages? Something which runs con continuously usually is there watching the bus and is going to react to things on the bus. And um, so this gives me all the scaffolding which I need um, to make sure that I'm a, a continuously running agent. And um, then I simply define a method called run. And run says, this is what I do when my agent starts. So what does my agent do when it starts? Um, it grabs the ExoBrain uh, interface off itself, and it specifies a watch loop. And a watch loop says I want to watch the bus uh, for a particular thing. 
In this case, I want to watch the bus for any uh, uh, object which is a class of measurement social. So ExoBrain breaks things into the idea of I can have a measurement, which is something I've observed about the world, and I can have an action or an intent, which is something which I want to do to change the world. So I want to see if I can observe anything from social media, and uh, then I can say there's going to be a filter associated with that, and then finally there's a then statement, which is this is what happens if that filter is successful. The filter in this case, uh, very straightforward, I'm going to grab my event, I'm going to get a list of tags off that event, because if you've got something like Twitter, for example, Twitter has hashtags, and then I'm going to check, is this an event which is actually to me? Um, you can actually do things where you say, I'm going to watch everyone I follow on Twitter, or I'm going to watch my entire Facebook stream, and you could do things with that, but in this case I want to make sure it's actually something which is pointed to me, so I'm mentioned in the tweet. And then I will simply want to say, hey, if I walk through all those tags, can I find a ping tag? And if I find a ping tag, then great, that's going to pass my, my filter. If it passes my filter, um, then all I'm going to do is grab my event, and I'm simply going to respond with an acknowledgement. And if you happen to know Perl, and you know about this thing called dollar underscore, you can also use dollar underscore. But I'm not going to go into that, because if you're not Perl people, you won't care. So this is something which you should be able to do now if you want. If you hop onto Twitter and you were to say uh, at PJF and put a hash ping tag in there, then what will happen is my agents will pick that up and they'll respond. Now the cool part is that they respond that they respond to that by calling a respond method on that measurement social packet. Now there is no such thing as a generic measurement social. That's essentially this abstract class which exists. All of your actual packets are a measurement social Twitter, or a measurement social Facebook, or a measurement social Instagram, or something like that. And each of them has their own respond method on here is how you respond using that form of social media. So this generates an intent response. It, in, it generates a packet which goes out and says, hey, I need to respond on Facebook, or I need to respond on Twitter. That then gets grabbed by a response agent for whatever that packet happens to be, and then your response gets tweeted. So what this means is that I can write recipes which work across all forms of social media, and this essentially abstracts away, how do I do a response there? How do I figure out what the tags are? How do I figure out if this is something which is to me? So that respond call is actually platform agnostic, which makes me incredibly happy. Um, let's also look at how we might write ourselves a, uh, a data class, something which is going to be pushed back and forth across the bus. Um, so one thing which I use all the time is a mailbox. And so um, if you remember earlier I had a graph which sort of graphed how much mail I had in my mailbox. Um, this is something I can use not just for email, but also for things such as um, you know, direct messages on, um, on Twitter or messages on Facebook, those sorts of things. Anything which is sort of treated like a mailbox. Um, so again, we start off with using ExoBrain and Moose, um, and in this case, there is a, a role which I can consume called ExoBrain Message, which gives me all of the extra sort of helper things uh, for writing messages which will be pushed across the bus. So now they have the ability to be sent and, uh, and sort of JSONified and so on and so forth. The most important thing uh, which ExoBrain Message gives me as a role is this payload keyword. And I can now say, here are a bunch of attributes, these are attributes which should be pushed across the bus. So I can say that for a, uh, an, a, a mailbox type, there is going to be a server, there's going to be a user, there's going to be a mailbox that might be inbox or sent or those sorts of things, and there's also going to be some sort of account there as well. The other thing which I need to do is I need to provide how do I specify a summary, because everything needs to have that human readable summary. Um, in this case here I say that's a lazy attribute which you uh, generate by calling the build summary method. And then if I look at that method, it simply says this user at this server with this mailbox has this, this number of messages. So it might be uh, paul at gmail.com has 1,053 messages. Might be that human readable um, agent. So you might be wondering, okay, what can I do, hook into uh, with ExoBrain? Uh, well, there's actually a whole bunch of stuff which it supports. Um, wow, I love these lights going on and off. Um, so at the much, when I wrote these slides, uh, it supported uh, IMAP, Twitter, Pushover, Facebook, Remember the Milk, which is a to-do tracker, uh, Foursquare, Beeminder, Habit RPG, and I'd done this. Um, but the cool part is, is because it supports Beeminder, 
which some of you may or may not have used, um, Beeminder lets you quantify your data across a whole bunch of other services. And so Beeminder hooks into GitHub and Wything Scales and Gmail and Fitbit and Rescue Time and Duolingo and anything. Um, anything which Beeminder can read, I can actually get into ExoBrain. And, um, and it's absolutely wonderful because, you know, Danny and Bethany will keep on adding new cool things to, uh, to Beeminder and I'll just be like, oh sweet, I'll just have that as well. So I essentially get all of these for free. So what are some of the things which I've been using ExoBrain for? Um, one of the things which I use it for is to do management. Um, I go to a lot of conferences and people are like, Paul, you need to meet this person or you need to read this thing or you need to do something. And um, I don't want to have to sit down and, and write those down, usually because I'm like crying into my computer writing my slides. And so I give other people the ability to add items to my to-do list. And uh, the way in which that works is, you know, via Twitter, you can tweet something to me at, at PJF. And if you include a hash to do tag, then what happens is it goes and adds it to the to tracker on my phone here. Um, and if I actually had Wi Fi access here, my phone would probably be buzzing away as people go and test that. Um, but you know, you can actually add things to my to do list. Um, that's really, really useful at conferences. Um, here's what it looks like. I should actually notice that uh, you actually get a receipt back. So here is a to do, you know, take a moment for a cup of tea. And, uh, and of course, my exo brand will give back a receipt. Thanks, I've added your to do item posted at such and such. And it CCs me on the receipt. Um, these days, this actually comes from my account at PJF and it doesn't bother to CC me in. Um, it just works. The other thing which I do is I use it with Habit RPG. Um, anyone here used Habit RPG before? Yeah, okay. So Habit RPG turns your life into a cheesy 8-bit computer role-playing game. And so you can say, hey, I've done some exercise, I get experience points, or oh no, I ate a whole bunch of pizza, I'm losing hit points for eating pizza. Um, so the idea is that it sort of encourages good habits and it discourages bad habits. And um, sure enough, there is a, a, a module which lets you interface into that, which I happen to write, uh, to wrote, happen to wrote, happen to write a, a little while ago. Um, there's also a command line utility. So if you don't like having to use the website, you can do everything on the command line, which is great. So something which happens uh, with putting all these things together, um, I will do something where I, you know, do a git commit, uh, and that will go off to GitHub. And of course, I have my GitHub account being monitored by Beeminder, so Beeminder will update my, my Gitminder graph. Um, it'll also call back to ExoBrain. ExoBrain will go, oh, hey, you've done stuff on GitHub. That's great. I'll send that to Habit RPG. Habit RPG will then give me experience points, which gets picked up by ExoBrain, and then it will then deliver that via Twitter to tell me how awesome I am. And I will get things like this. Congratulations, you gained seven experience points for completing respond to email. Or congratulations, you gained seven and a half experience points for doing a GitHub commit. And um, these days, uh, I mentioned to some of you earlier that I actually have an RFID tag and I can scan that with my phone when I floss my teeth. So I put that where I keep my dental floss, I put my phone there and it picks that up and then it Pounce, pounces that off to Beeminder and the same sort of thing happens. And like two seconds after I put my phone down, I have a notification on my watch that I'm gaining experience points for flossing my teeth. So working features, stuff that sort of I've been using, you can get out of the box. Um, getting experience points for responding to email. I suck at responding to email. So this sort of gives me a little bit of encouragement for that. Um, doing to-do tasks from Twitter, from Twitter uh, which means I now have the most ridiculous number of to-do items you could ever imagine from across the world. Um, I did have to modify my code a little bit. Um, it can now pick up if you're sending me anything to do with Rick Astley, um, because otherwise there was a lot of Rick Astley activity which was going on. Um, updating Beeminder graphs for all sorts of things, uh, getting XP on Habit RPG for commits and running and flossing and so on and so forth. Um, logging travel locations, I actually do this a lot. Um, so I will check into somewhere on Foursquare and that will get added to my, uh, my I done this log. And if I have that tagged with something like an office tag, then it's like, oh, we'll give you experience points for that as well. We'll update a graph for that as well. And of course, the much, much generic, much, much more. So if you want to be playing with ExoBrain, the place to go to is github.com slash pjfxobrain. Um, I'll, of course, be sticking around a little bit here uh, at your C++ user group where we're doing no C++ at all in this talk. Uh, you can ask me for help if you want. And uh, I hope that with ExoBrain and with systems like that, you can go forth and use your data for good. Ladies, good. ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. <laughs> So, um, that was, what was the request, 28 minutes?
27 27 and a half. 27, oh man, it was 28 and a half. So, just failed. <laughs> so, do I have any questions? Awesome, let's eat pizza. <laughs> cool, thank you. <laughs> oh, this is your laptop. I should just give it, no. No, it's your laptop. Yes. Would you like a laptop, sir? <laughs> we have one laptop, which we're giving away as a door prize. It talks to the 